um, success stories. Uh, we do obviously have our main speaker, which is Karen Hill. Uh, we're going to be sharing some active job leads via partner updates. And we will also be um, announcing our next time at Job Club. Our mission for Job Club is to provide a positive environment for job seekers to network and learn best practices for the job search. We meet the second and fourth Tuesday of each month, and you can find our schedule of topics at www.ukalumni.net slash job club. And so we are um, presently in Fayette County Extension Office. We have in-person availability there. And uh, we want to welcome those that are joining us uh, through our webinar and Facebook live streaming. Uh, we do offer the invitation that if you're in the Central Kentucky area, please stop by the Fayette Extension Office and uh, join us. We'd love to meet you in person. And we do have some great opportunities for networking uh, following our job club session. We'd like for you to meet the job club facilitators. Um, in addition to myself, there's Caroline Francis. She's director of alumni career services. Uh, her cohort is Amanda Shagney, and she's associate director. Nicole Waite is with our employment. Uh, she is an employment specialist at UK Steps, temporary employment. And then we all just shout out to Suzanne Smith and Sonny Saylor here at the Fayette County Extension Office who um, certainly help us with this production. Job Club is currently hosted in a hybrid format. So as I mentioned, we're here in person in Fayette County. We have the Zoom web webinar as well as Facebook Live. So we invite you to um, participate in any of those, those ways. In the interim of when, between when Job Club meets, we do have available a free Job Club resource packet online. And uh, please check that out. It is very helpful in a, in a variety of ways. Um, everything from informational interview tips to Central Kentucky networking opportunities. We have resume review, checklist, and so on. So uh, go to our website, www.ukalumni.net slash job club to, um, to, to take advantage of that. In addition, we'd like to invite you to join the Central Kentucky Job Club Sharing Community on LinkedIn. And we often um, list job leads on that site, as well as resources um, in, in addition to our website. We always welcome employers and recruiters uh, to share their job leads. If they're in person, we, we give a one minute uh, spotlight. And if not, then we can also allow you to speak on the webinar, if just raise your hand. So, um, at, Following our presentation, we'll, we'll make an announcement for that opportunity. Watch your email later today for job leads that have been sent, shared with the job club team. Some attendees are conducting a confidential job search, so let's please be respectful of privacy for the job search of others. And again, uh, we do have those job search related articles that are included in our job club reminder emails. We do also offer recordings and PowerPoint slides, again, at the Job Club website. A real tradition of Job Club is to welcome our first timers. And if you're online, we'd love for you to go to that chat box and toggle to, um, to everyone, all attendees, and tell us where you're from. We'd love to know where you're from and perhaps what job you're looking for, your area of interest, so that we can uh, officially welcome you to Job Club. And that includes anyone, even if you're not a first timer. But we, we do especially like to acknowledge anyone that is joining us uh, for the very first time. We would like to remind you that you could scan the QR code below. Um, and it's on your job, job uh, on a slide, on your website, and uh, that will allow you to take a quick survey, and that information will put you into our, uh, our data bank that we can send you our emails and advance notices of, of upcoming 
opportunities with Job Club. And in addition, while you're in that chat box, and uh, if anyone in our audience today, we'd love to hear a success story. So does anyone have something they would like to share today related to your job search and what we will always consider a success if you've moved forward in that search? That could be anything from an interview, revising your resume, Perhaps you've reached out to uh, a former colleague and you have, have created a network. Any, anyone that has something to share uh, on, on the website, we would love to hear that. And we have one right now we'd like to, uh, Caroline's going to share. Yes, congratulations, Susan. It sounds like you have a second Zoom interview coming up in Nashville. We wish you the best of luck. Good luck on that. So we do want you to definitely, definitely, we, we, normally, uh, I think at our last session, we announced uh, at least two, two job fulfillments, you know, actually, we actually got the job announcements. And uh, that's always wonderful and great. And we really encourage you to let us know uh, when, you, when you do land that job, because we like to, to celebrate with you. But keep in mind that up to that point, there are successes, and those successes are, are important, and we want you to share those as well. Well, now it's time for us to begin our program. I'm so excited about today. Um, we, we just have a, a terrific speaker with, with such a wealth of information, Karen Hill. Um, she has so many um, uh, certifications and degrees behind her, her name. I'm, I'm not gonna list that, they'll be on our website. Uh, but, but Karen is uh, an RN and, and et cetera, and she has recently retired from 28 years as the Chief Operating Officer, Chief Nursing Officer from Baptist Health Lexington, where she supervised 2,800 employees. Dr. Hill led Baptist Health Lexington to magnet de designation four times during her tenure, recognizing nursing excellence. Dr. Hill is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Nursing Administration, an international scholarly peer-reviewed journal. She pro professes over 375 manuscripts for JONA annually and produces 11 editions a year for over 10,000 subscribers in 140 six countries. Dr. Hill represents internationally on a leadership development, bringing evidence for practice, tips for publishing, and working with an editor, leading an intergenerational workforce, and the retention of experienced older employees, among other areas of expertise. Dr. Hill has over 75 peer-reviewed publications and is co-author of a book released in 2018, Creating a Research-Friendly Environment, a Community Hospital Approach. It is with uh, great delight that I welcome Dr. Hill, and uh, we just couldn't be happier and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, and thank you all for asking me today. I knew that we were going to have a Zoom audience, and so I'm going to be presenting to the people in the room, but also to you in Zoom, because I want to make sure that as much as I can, I try to address basic questions about reinventing yourself or about approaching that first job. So we're going to go through things like how to apply for a job and what to look for with the right job, re-looking at your resume and making sure that your resume is appropriate for the job that you're applying for, and then a few interview tips. So hopefully I'll cover some things that will be relevant for everyone today. This is a picture of the hospital that I just retired from. I was an employee there for 36 years, but um, like a lot of you, I never went into the nursing career thinking I was going to be running a hospital. In fact, when I was 14 years old, I was a candy striper or a volunteer at the same hospital that I was later in charge of. Um, and I always say that I'm the best story in the world of working your way up. But what that gave me was at 14 years old as a volunteer in the community, um, it gave me an opportunity to watch people at work. And I had never had a healthcare person in my family before. And because of that exposure, I became very interested in a career in nursing. And so I think one of those lessons learned is you never know when people are watching. And oftentimes you can be a role model for other people in the way that you talk or do your role. 
or your job, and it's really important. And that impacted my life for my whole career. Um, our objectives today, we're going to talk about the characteristics and techniques for a successful job interview candidate. We're going to re review suggestions for improving your resume and building on previous experience. I find a lot of times when people interview for jobs and present a resume, they don't give themselves credit for some of their previous experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about ideas for moving uh, your career forward and for potentially looking at a new role or a new direction for your career. So my story. Um, I'm a person from Lexington, Kentucky. I grew up here. I went to Garden Springs, Beaumont, and Lafayette. If you're familiar with Lexington, those are all local schools um, from a really hardworking family, and I was the first college graduate. My first degree in nursing was an associate degree. I believe in the technical and vocational school system. It was a way for me to get a job and to get out of school um, fairly quickly and into a career that I wanted to do passionately. Um, after I started that role, I decided that I needed to go back to school, and one of my lessons learned is to be sure and take advantage or to learn about career um, benefits and opportunities because through tuition reimbursement at Baptist, I was able to go back and get a bachelor's degree and later a master's degree, and at 50 years old, I went back and got my doctorate. Tuition reimbursement didn't cover the entire cost but it made it where I did not graduate with huge debt and loan. And it was very important for me at the time to do that throughout my career. Another thing I think is that you have to prepare yourself. Like I said, I've been back to school several times. In, in deciding to go back to school, it's not that I didn't love what I was doing. Bedside nursing is a very fulfilling role. And, and those patient interactions, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's just you leave work knowing that you've helped people and it's a great feeling. Um, I looked at what were my options though for other kinds of roles in nursing and knew that to do that, I was gonna to have to advance my education. And so I went ahead and signed up for a bachelor's in nursing program. And for the same questions and the same interest later, got into a master's program. And so that lesson learned for me is you have to prepare yourself ahead of time. Jobs won't wait for you. If a job requires a certain educational credential, you need to think ahead and be strategic and plan ahead to attain that because that then you'll be uh, job ready whenever that's available. Another thing I wanna make sure and emphasize, and Diana talked about this a little bit in her introduction, but networking is huge. Now, people often think about networking that it's just related to your job, but in fact, I would challenge you that networking is everywhere. Networking is socially with your friends and relatives. Networking is in your church. Networking is in your neighborhood. It depends on where you want to place your time because all of us have time limits on when we're available and how much time we can spend meeting others and being a good networker. And to do that, you have to make sure that one, you present yourself appropriately in the audience that you're with. I know some of the best networks I've had have been people I've met at meetings. And as I've met them, I've tried to make sure that we have contact information that we share together, that they know a little bit about me. There may be a reason where they could help me or I could help them later on with a career decision. And so those things are important. I think the other thing is there are, there are community networks that are huge. If you're not really involved in your community in a volunteer way, I would challenge you to find one thing that you care about in your community and make some time for a volunteer activity because not only are you giving back to others, but you're also developing another social network that can be very valuable both personally and professionally. So you cannot underestimate the value of networking. When you network with people, not only do you present yourself to them, but you need to stay in contact with them. It's good every now and then to just sit, send an email or send a text and say, you know, I'm uh, free for lunch in a couple of weeks. Didn't know if you wanted to meet for lunch. Um, I wondered if you'd be a good reference for me on this job application and those sort of things. So it's very important to continue those relationships. Skills are important as a formal education, and, and I'm a very educated person now. I've been back to school four times in my life, but if I didn't have relationship skills and common sense, I'm not going to be worth a lot to an employer, and one of the things that I learned early on in my career, when I was 20 years old, I was put in charge of a nursing unit at the hospital that it was my first job, because that was what we did to people 43 years ago. New nurses were put in charge. Um, I learned the value of experience and a common sense. And I had two licensed practical nurses and two nursing assistants working with me. I was the team leader at the time and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And if it wasn't for those two people that were LPNs and those two nursing assistants, I would not have been a successful charge nurse. I learned early on 
that experience matters, common sense matters. And so in a combination with experience and education and common sense, you can have the whole package, but you really need all of them together. And in addition, I would challenge that in today's environment, you need relationship skills. I think you need to know how to get along with the team. I joke around with people a lot. Well, really the only people you can choose to be with are the people you marry. You can't choose your family. You can't choose your friends always. Sometimes there are people that you have to be uh, friendly with. You can't choose your coworkers, but you have to learn how to get along with people. And relationship skills are huge. And it's something that people have to learn. Now, there are some boundaries and barriers in relationship skills, particularly at work. And I think you have to be careful. And sometimes I think people cross the line between friends and coworkers. You wanna be careful that you pr protect your privacy, that you watch for, um, I think, too close of interactions that can impact your impression or the perception of you at work, but it's good to have those social relationships, potlucks, meeting people, and that kind of thing. I think you need to be careful, though, but those work relationships are huge. You want to be the kind of employee that you would want to work for you. I've always used that as sort of my golden rule. I don't care what job I had, whether I was in charge of a hospital, whether I'm in charge of a department, whether I'm working as a coworker. Or I'm reporting to someone else. I always felt like if I did what I would want from another employee who reported to me or who worked for me, then I would be doing the right thing. And that comes to being to work on time, being accountable in my role, being somebody dependable to show up and be there when I'm supposed to be there, delivering the kind of work that people would expect for an employee to do. Those things help me with the golden rule. It even helped me a little bit when I looked at my role in healthcare because as I got into healthcare a little bit, I had the opportunity to plan buildings, which is a really amazing experience for a clinical person. And one of the things that I looked at when I was building hospitals and nursing units and departments was, would this be the kind of unit that I would want for my family? And as I did that, it's that sort of golden rule again, is this what I would want for my family? Am I the kind of employee that I would want working for me? So really basic going from small decisions to really large construction decisions. Another one that I think we all have to think about is being open for change. You know, I've written a lot about the pandemic in the last couple of years because I'm a healthcare person. Um, and a pandemic's affected the whole world. It's, it's affected healthcare people in a lot of different ways, but there are a lot of people who have been working every day during the pandemic, not in healthcare that have been affected as much. And I think we all have to be open for change. This is a good example. You know, this room's not packed today, but we've got a lot of great people here. But I think we have to be open to a Zoom environment, to a video virtual environment, because I think when we have people who are not able to have transit time, maybe they have a, a short window where they can learn, we have to adapt the way we teach. We have to adapt the way we meet. We have to adapt the way we interview. And I heard somebody saying they were having a Zoom interview. I mean, the, we're different now. now when you have a Zoom interview, you have to think about it like you're sitting there in the room with the person that's interviewing you. You have to take it as seriously, and it sounds like this person has. You want to dress for that appropriately. You want to make sure that there's no interference in the background. You want to have a quiet place. You want to think about the questions before you're asked, just like you would if you were in person. You want to be careful and reflective in your comments, but you're still on a Zoom interview and you're not on TV somewhere and you are eventually gonna meet this person and they potentially could be your boss. And so it's really important that we have our mindset change that a Zoom interview could be the introductory interview for a lot of jobs in the future. It doesn't mean that there won't be an opportunity for a tour or an on-site or another interview following up, but oftentimes people will use virtual so that they can try to decide is this a potential good fit or not. In the hospital, we did that a lot because it saved travel cost. As we interviewed people from outside the Lexington or Kentucky area, and I know a lot of you are from other states, we wanted to make sure that it was a good fit before we spent the money to bring them in. And so those interviews on Zoom could be a decision maker between bringing somebody in for a second interview or not. So very important. I applaud the person that's going to have a second Zoom interview. Um, and I would give you those tips. You see those funny commercials about somebody doing Zoom and they've got their underwear on and a coffee pot in the background and the cat's running through the screen and all that stuff. You want to think about, like, if I was on site, what would be appropriate? And that's what you need to do when you're in Zoom. I would even challenge you that if the camera's in your bedroom, you want to turn it so it's not facing the bed. You want to look at what's in the background on your video because you want to make sure that it's a professional or calm or nondescript background when you're on camera for Zoom. And that would go for a Zoom meeting as well, but particularly for an interview. 
The last thing I think is to give your job 110%. I hired a lot of people at the hospital. We had a lot of people that had successful careers there, but the best employees gave it 110%. They came to work and they worked hard. And that's recognized. People see that. You know, sometimes people will ask me, well, how do you get promoted? Well, one way you get promoted is to be a great employee. You become an employee like you would want working for you, and you give your job 110%. That's that above and beyond. It's thinking of new ways to help somebody. It's making a suggestion to your boss. It's helping to be the kind of employee that says, I'll volunteer to do this. And there were many times in my career where I've been in situations where I maybe didn't know everything about what I was going to be involved with, but it was a learning opportunity that gave me new skills that made me more valuable. So being open to change and being 110% employee are really good skills and things that have benefited me. Okay, there are some workforce trends that we can't ignore. Things are different now. For one thing, the pandemic has affected things. There are less jobs now but more jobs open. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of industries that have shifted their models. So for example, we may look at the hotel industry. There are still hotels that have occupancies, particularly if there's an event um, in town or something that's going on, a hotel could be busy, but there are less meetings and conventions. And so when you look at the jobs that most hotels in larger cities have had to support meetings and conventions, there are less of those roles now than before. However, there are more jobs that are available in other kinds of industries like Amazon. I heard yesterday that um, the post office in Louisville, Kentucky added 400 jobs for the holidays. They're doing that because people are shipping more. They may not be going to see family and they may be sending gifts and other kinds of things. So the traffic in the mail system is gonna be up. So 400 jobs may not be available in a hotel but they may be available in the Postal Service. And I think we have to go back and look at where are the jobs right now. One thing we all know is that childcare is expensive. Childcare was expensive when my kids were little and they're older now, but childcare is really expensive now. And it's something that every parent wants safe childcare. You don't wanna worry about your children when you're at work. And I know that there are a lot of national initiatives looking at um, how we can help reimburse childcare workers more, how we can help make childcare safer, how we can offer education for children that are three and four years old for early pre-K. Those things are really good things because parents need to know that their children are safe when they're at work. It's the number one thing you worry about when you're a parent is your children. And so that is something to think about. If you have an employer that you're applying for a job and they have a childcare agency, you need to look at that as a huge benefit if you have children, because it might be something that enables you to have a discount for childcare compared to a, an outside for-profit company. One thing that we did at Baptist, and this is an idea for people, if you are an employer and you're watching, um, our childcare had some vacancies and we opened up childcare for the children of grandparents who were employees at the hospital because we wanted to help retain those older workers. And we found that sometimes older workers would stay if their grandchildren could have good daycare. And so we added them to our child care as an opportunity for enrollment and had a lot of grandparents who were employees at the hospital who were interested in their grandchildren being in our child development center. For some, federal benefits have lessened the intensity to come back to work, but those are temporary. You know, I think if you've been around the block, you know that um, benefits come and go. Uh, national leaders come and go and programs come and go. And so I would hate to think that you're going to be dependent on something like that for longevity. I don't think it's going to work. Usually those kind of programs are put in temporary as a bridge for employees. And you want to look at it like that because that's not a sustainable long-term plan for anybody, but it is something that has helped in the short term. And we're thankful for that. Um, the great reassessment is one, and I see this a lot from everybody I think there are people who took a break either at their own will or based on an employer <coughs> in the workforce and they maybe had a stop in their career and it gave them pause to think, is this what I really wanna do? Is this the kind of job that I want in the future? Is this the kind of job that I'm gonna be excited about going back to when the pandemic relieves? Um, or is it time for me to make a career change? Uh, maybe it's not a career change from the kind of job you have. Maybe it's a change from the employer that you were with. Maybe it's a change, a whole change in a career. One thing that the data have shown is that there are a lot of people that have taken the opportunities during the pandemic to open up their own businesses. Um, there are more people and they call them entrepreneurs, people who go out and start a new company. Now, I think you have to be prepared for that. And I'm sure the 
um, UK Career Center has all kinds of uh, resources for people who are thinking about opening up a business because that in itself is a very complicated deal, but not, not insurmountable, not something that you can't do. And so I think the pandemic has opened up those opportunities as well. There have been opportunities for new businesses that have needed to be opened up to help meet the demand in the pandemic. So maybe you had an idea for a job that wasn't really going to be something that was in demand for a company before the pandemic. But now that things have changed and people are doing things differently, maybe now your idea is something that would be valuable to people. So something to think about. I think there are shifting expectations. One of the things that I've seen is that there are uh, people who work well at home and people who don't. There are jobs that work well at home and jobs that are never going to work well at home. Healthcare is a good example. In the hospital, we had people that had to come to work to take care of patients every day at the bedside. We needed those people to show up, and those jobs are not going to be jobs that you can do virtually at home. However, we were lucky enough to be able to have some roles for nurses and other clinical people, even some physicians, through telemedicine where they could do remote work and still work for us and maintain their careers or advance their careers because that was a different kind of skill. And so I think there are people who have enjoyed telecommuting. They've enjoyed being at home. Um, they've been productive. They've been able to learn new things and maybe develop other skills. And they like that atmosphere. Now, if you're a young person in your career, it's an isolating experience to work from home. It's not that you don't have those networks on Zoom and you don't have those career opportunities. But for someone older in their career where you've already had those networks and opportunities, that may be something that's easy for you and you've already made those connections. If you're a young person and you want to have opportunities to meet others to help advance your career, to have them really learn more about you, you may even need a hybrid model where you do some in person and some remote. So I think the expectations have changed. And that's something as you look at a job, you want to look at what are the flexibilities that are offered here? Are there options where you could work 14 hour days and have a day off on a weekend or a Monday where you could do those 40 hours during the week? Is it a 40 hour job? Um, is it something that can be done part time? And what are the benefits that are associated with that? But I think people are starting to question the expectations of a very rigid Monday through Friday, five days a week, eight hours a day job as being the norm. And I think we'll continue to see those um, challenged as we look forward. There are employers that have adopted that and there are employers that have had a hard time moving forward with that. But I feel like in the future, people will have to become more flexible because they wanna be competitive in the workforce to get you some of the best workers. I think there's been an increase in baby boomers retiring. You heard Diana say that I just recently retired from the hospital. I've been an employee there for 36 years. I've been a nurse for 43 years. Um, but I decided at this time in my life, I'm in my early 60s, it was a good time for me to um, be a little more available to help my kids with my grandchildren, to uh, do more travel, and to just have some time to do the things that I want to do. You heard that I'm an editor of a nursing journal. That's an international job, but I do it from my family room, and I can do it flexible to my own schedule, which is a really nice part-time job for me. Um, the hospital was a demanding job, and I will have to tell you that the last couple of years during the pandemic were the most stressful years of my life. Leading an organization during a pandemic when the rules were changing and the science was changing and things were emerging, and all of a sudden in one day, things that we thought were never going to be an issue like a normal supply of masks became an issue for safety for our staff it was stressful. Um, I felt like that I was in the right place at the right time because I was mature enough to have been in other situations where there were unexpected and unforeseen emergencies. Um, I felt like that I had the team that could handle it. We were doing the right things. We were thoughtful. We protected our patients and our staff, but we had to make some hard decisions. Things like stopping visiting. There's nothing more difficult than taking a family member away from a patient. And, and putting that added stress on the staff because then the staff had to become the, the support for those patients and the conduit where they could have their, their family system. Um, and so those things were tough. And I just decided when the vaccine program came out and I felt like that there was an end in sight or at least a, a respite, um, it was a good time for me to take advantage of my retirement plans, which I'd honestly, honestly already thought about. Um, there are other people like me that are going to be looking at that. I'm considered a baby boomer. I was born in 1958, so from 46 to 64, there are people that are thinking about retirement. 
one of the things that I looked at in my doctoral program is how you can keep employees that are over 45 engaged in their careers. I really feel like that they're the best workforce are young and new innovative approaches to things from people who have not been settled in how things have always been done. There are mid-careerists who have got experience, who have worked, who know how to do things, and who have experience. And then there are those senior careerists, people who have been in their jobs for a while, who have been through multiple experiences, who can offer that sage wisdom. Now, it's interesting, when I say young and new experienced, I had uh, a new graduate nurse who was 51 years old. She'd been a teacher and she retired from her career and she wanted a second career. One of the best nurses we ever had at the hospital. And she was so energetic and so excited about her career. She had that same approach that a 22 year old has when they graduate from their program and they're enthusiastic about getting in. But she wasn't the youngest employee that we had that was starting as a new grad. In fact, she was really a benefit to some of the younger employees because she had been an employee before for someone for a long period of time. But I think that when you look at the workforce and the baby boomers that are coming through, you will find both as an employer, there are baby boomers that will approach you about a part-time different kind of role than their previous careers. And there are baby boomers who will be looking to retire from their full-time roles and potentially look for something part-time. So I would challenge you, if you're an employer, I think anything that you can do to help be flexible and create roles to keep these seasoned, experienced employees in the system is a good thing. In my research and my doctoral program, I found that a lot of experienced employees will take a significant pay cut to have more flexibility in their schedule and learn something new. And I think that that's still true. And I think we need to go back and look at how we can keep these seasoned employees in their jobs. There's definitely been an increase in entrepreneurship. We talked about that. And I think there's a mismatch in the openings and the skills. For one thing, I think in today's environment, we have technology. Um, a lot of people are using Zoom that never used Zoom before. Now, thank goodness for Sunday school and clubs and meetings and things like that, because it exposed people to Zoom who maybe would not have been exposed in their roles, and it forced people how to use it. I know there are people in my church that are following my church service on Facebook Live that have never been on Facebook before um, the pandemic. And so I think it's been good in that regard because it's exposed people to social media and virtual technology. But I think there are other things that are new skills that we need to go back and look at. For one thing, I think um, in healthcare particularly, we need to be more aware of infectious disease. It's something that's going to be, uh, it's never going to go away. We're always going to have to worry about contagious diseases. We could have another pandemic in a couple of years with some other new uh, disease. And, and we need to be careful about that. But I think in other kinds of careers also, teachers are a good example. They have to flip-flop sometimes from one day to the next from an in-class setting to a virtual learning based on uh, containment and quarantine. That's a new skill for a lot of teachers. Now, some teachers are good at that, but some of them, it's been more difficult. It's sometimes not as much fun. I, I was telling the staff here, I've done a couple of um, lectures to some national meetings in the past couple of months, and they've all been on Zoom. I really enjoy a packed house for a session because I can look at people, I can see them, I interact with their eyes and the audience, and it's a fun thing to do. When I'm speaking to a national meeting on Zoom, um, and a couple of weeks ago I had 400 nurses in Louisiana on Zoom, I can't see them. The camera wasn't focused on them, the camera was showing me because I was the speaker. For me, that's a new skill. It's something that I've done, and I've done it now a lot in the last couple of years, but it's not always something that people are comfortable with. I remember a class I took at UK um, in my bachelor's program. It was a teaching and learning class. And it was the first time I'd ever been videotaped as a speaker. That's a that's a enlightening experience to be videotaped. <clears throat> for one thing, I didn't realize how Southern my accent was. Um, and for the second, I talked too fast. Now I'm still a rapid speaker um, and I've toned down the accent. Now you all are from Kentucky and other states, but a lot of you are from Kentucky. so. You may not even think I have any accent, but I do. And if you're from New England, you would definitely think I'm from the South somewhere. Um, but I have to think about that. When I'm talking to an audience or someone who may have trouble understanding me, I have to make sure that I try to change things so that they can understand me. Um, and I think that's the same if you're working, if you're from a, a Southern state or a state with a dialect and you're working with people across the country, you need to think about how you're coming across because the language or the, the accent that you have for your region of the country may not be what's appropriate in California or in Oregon or Washington state. 
I, th- I heard a story about 9-11 and, you know, you think you've seen all the stories about 9-11, but this one was on the news about a month ago and it was profiling the experience of the New York Fire Department in 9-11. And it was a totally different way to look at that experience. And it was a great story. It was on um, 60 Minutes and they talked about it and they interviewed one of the captains and his name was Pete Ganey. And one of the things he said, and he was talking about his role in the fire department, You'll never be rich, but you'll always be happy. And I thought, how great is that, that somebody can feel that way about their job? That's what you want. You know, we, life is short and we have, we have a limited amount of time to spend with the people that we love. And you have a lot of time that you spend on your job. And if you can have a job that you really love and you feel like you make a difference and you feel like you're appreciated, it's huge. And I thought this was a great saying and what I would want all employees to feel like if they're in the right spot. Okay, so you're going to take charge of your career. What do you need to do? Well, before you apply for a job, you got to be clear what you want about the job. One thing that drives me crazy is when people interview for a job and they come in and you talk to them about why they want the job and they don't have a good answer. I always, it was funny when my kids were growing up and they started interviewing for jobs, we practiced interviews because I I mean, interview questions are fairly generic. Um, There are some that are more specific to a particular role, like in healthcare, but there are a lot of questions that you can just anticipate are going to be asked by someone who wants to employ you. One, why do you want this job? And I think you need to think about the answer. Now, I would suggest that one of the things that you want to do is not just about what will it do for you, but what will you do for the company? When you're interviewing for a job, what can you bring to that company and why do you want that job? And if you're in something similar, why do you want to change? I always believe it's better not to be too negative in an interview. I have interviewed people that the the only thing I got out of the interview is how much, how unhappy they were with their current job and how much they didn't like the person they worked for. And it always makes you worry, will they be a negative person when they come work for you? So I think that's important. Will this job help you attain a goal? Is it going to help you with more money or with a secure income? Will it help you with new job skills? Will it help your career interest? Those things are fine. Now, I wouldn't particularly tell somebody in an interview that you want this job because it pays more money. But you know in your heart if that's an option and that that's something that's available, that's a good thing. You know, you hate to see somebody take a job for less, um, although I have done that. And there are times when sometimes taking a pay cut is an appropriate thing. I remember uh, Brian and I lived in Nashville for a couple of years. And when I came back to Lexington, the pay grade for nurses was less than the pay grade that they were paying in Nashville at the time. And I took a job for less, but the job that I took opened up opportunities for me to be able to have advancement in other areas later. And if I held out and tried to look for something that was going to pay more, I might not have had those same opportunities. So I always tell people it's not necessarily a negative if you take a different job for less. If you have a career path from that that's going to help you in the end, you may have to be more patient and it may not be an immediate return, but it can be a long-term return. Think about the ability that you have to commit to the company. I hate to see people who apply for a job and know that they're not going to stay. I think that's a waste of time for the company. I think that's a waste of time for the employee. Now, if it's a part-time or a temporary job, that's one thing. They don't expect you to stay. They're hiring you temporary. Um, Like the postal people, I don't think they're going to keep all 400 of those people in Louisville after the holiday rush, although they probably could use some extra help. Um, But if it's a a permanent job, the employer is going to spend money on you. They're going to spend money training you. They've spent money recruiting you. They're going to spend money doing police checks and background checks and processing you through HR. They're going to spend money on orientation. And it's going to take time for you to become a competent worker. You owe them something. Now, you can make a bad career decision and take a wrong job and find out after you get there that you hate it. But I always tell people, give it a little bit of time because sometimes what you don't like is just because you're insecure and you don't know. If you did decide that you made a bad career decision and you need to leave this job or leave a particular job, make sure you're going to make a good decision the next time. Because one thing I look for on resumes is people that have had an unstable career opportunities. And I'll look and see if this person's had a job this year, a job the next year, a job two years ago, a job three years ago. Why would I think that they're going to stay with me longer when they haven't got a career record where they've stayed? Now, you can explain that to a point. And then there's a point where you can't explain it and you just need to take a job and be stable for a while and establish some career um, tenure so that people know that you can commit. So that's important. Um, The other thing I think that's important is to look at the look at the company and what they need 
and talk to the person that's interviewing you about what you can bring to help commit to the company. You know, you can bring this new skill, you can bring this previous experience, and we're going to talk about that. You want to reflect on the experience that you're getting ready to go through and you want to learn from it. You may have been through, and hopefully all of you have been through some job interviews sometime in the past. It could have been a long time ago, but you have done job interviews. You want to think about those previous job interviews and what you know you could have done better. And Everybody could do things better. The other thing, though, is if you don't get a job and you've done interviews, I always feel like people owe you feedback, honest feedback about why you did not get a job. And sometimes people do not feel comfortable asking that, and some people do not feel comfortable giving that. But I always feel like it's an appropriate thing if they could tell you now it's how you ask the question, you know. So why didn't I get the job is not necessarily the nicest way to ask the question. But could you ask someone, what could I have done different to help me look more favorable in this interview? Can you give me some tips about what I did not do as well as the other candidate that got the job so that I can learn from it? Were there some questions that I answered that I could have done better that would have helped me be better as a candidate for the job? So other ways that you can approach the same thing and get the answer, but always you want to learn from those mistakes or opportunities. So resumes are a big deal. I think people take resumes for granted. It's crazy, and this is just sort of a career hint. Um, I had the same role, not the same job. I had multiple jobs, but I worked for the same organization for 36 years. But I always kept my resume current. My resume was on file. My resume was a living, breathing document. Now, why do I do that? Because I wasn't looking for a job. It's because you can't remember what you do and you can't remember those career successes and you can't remember if you did, your team presented something and saved the company $10,000 or you were in charge of a diversity team and you were able to do this or whatever. If you keep your resume available on file, you should add those things a couple of times a year things that are experiences that you want to go back and reflect on so that you can remember those later because what you're doing is you're doing documentation of your skill set building. And so that's an important thing. The other thing that I think is important is to make sure your resume looks professional. Misspelled words and poor grammar drive me crazy. Now I'm an editor and so I, I edit manuscripts for my job now. But in a resume, you want to make sure that you haven't spell checked yourself to death and that it's wrong that words haven't been used inappropriately and that there's not spacing errors and that sort of thing. So be critical and look at your resume and make sure that it reads well. It is always a good idea to let someone else read it for proofreading. And I would suggest that because then you can see if there's errors or typos that you need to correct. You want to look at the company application and complete it neatly and completely. Now, a lot of applications are online now. It makes things a little more complicated. Hopefully, you have access to a computer and the internet at your home. But if you don't, go to a public library or someplace. Uh, I'm sure the job core, uh, office here has access to a computer for you. But you want to be able to access it online because online skills are going to be essential at almost any company, even if it's an annual mandatory education online. Um, complete the application fully. Um, if it's in writing, write legibly and write plainly so that people can see it because the, the quality of your writing will also be something they judge you by. Attach your resume. If you have a chance online to attach a resume, go ahead and do it. Don't wait to be asked. Just upload your resume with the application. Now, I've told people for many years, you don't have one version of your resume. You want to look at the job that you're applying for and you want to emphasize the skills that you have for the job that you're applying for. So, for example, um, when I was a nurse that was in charge of a department, I had employees reporting to me and the skills that were important were communication skills. They were my clinical skills, the ability to interview people, the ability to provide feedback for people for performance and the ability to understand patient care. As I got to be the chief operating, of the uh, operating officer of the hospital, the skills that were important for my job were how to develop business plans, how to lead the administrative team, how to work with the community to represent the hospital um, in charities and in other kinds of roles, how to work with our administrative board, how to help uh, develop budgets annually. So different kinds of skills. If I'd used the same resume from my nurse director role to my chief operating role, I would have never gotten the job. But in the meantime, in those 20 years, I developed those other skills that were important as a chief operating officer that allowed me to be selected for that job. So you have different versions of your resume based on what your job is. If you're looking for something in the hospitality industry, you want to emphasize your relationship skills. 
In the hospitality industry, if you've had a job in fast food before, you've got customer service skills. And so you want to take advantage of those things as you're looking at your resume based on what you're applying for. You want to accurately reflect the jobs that you've had and the dates that you've had them. Don't make mistakes on your resume because if people go back and check and they find that there's an error, they're going to think you're not telling the truth when in fact it could have been a human error. And once you get those dates accurate, then you'll have them accurate moving forward. You want to give yourself credit for volunteer work and experiences. Sometimes I've had people that have graduated programs and come to work at the hospital and they'll say, I really haven't had a job before. And I said, you haven't had a job? And they said, well, not as a nurse. And I said, well, what have you done? And they said, well, I worked at Malone's. Well, that's a job. You need to put that down. You know how to work under pressure. You know how to turn things around quickly. You know how customer service, you can handle money. Those things are good skills. You should not, not discount and not give yourself credit. Occasionally, I've had people that have said, I've elected to stay home with my children. You know, you want to put that down. You don't want to leave a big gap on your resume. You can say, I left the workforce to stay with my children for five years um, between the years of 2010 and 2015 or whatever. You also want to accurately reflect other kinds of experiences. So write the title that you had and some of the things that were, that were your responsibilities in the previous jobs that you've had. Not too much, not too little, be succinct, but describe your jobs because sometimes the jobs are weird titles and people can't tell what you're talking about. Um, volunteer activities is something, if you've been a volunteer in a, in a charity or something like that, or you've led a committee, even if you've led a committee at church, you wanna put that down as a volunteer activity. Those things are important in a lot of businesses, community work is important. Um, customize your resume, we talked about that, proofread and spelling, keep your resume current, and be able to explain what looks like frequent job changes or gaps. Now, if you're married to somebody in the military and they've moved you around a lot, you've had frequent job changes, you can easily explain that, but just be prepared to explain that. Um, and make sure your contact information is front and center. Now, um, you don't need to put your a lot of personal details on there about your marital status or any of that kind of stuff. You do need to put your email address and your cell phone number because people need to know how to find you. And then it would be good to put a, a address for home if uh, you're applying for a job on your resume. So if you have an interview, what do you do? Well, you wanna spend some time researching the company. You wanna go back and look at their mission and vision because you wanna talk about how you can contribute to what is important to the company. You want to also look at their website. You want to learn a little about their leadership, about where the company is based, where the headquarters are, and that sort of thing. Even if you're talking about McDonald's, you want to know something about where you're going to work and who owns the McDonald's, how long it's been there, and that kind of thing. You want to ask who you're going to interview with. You need to know who you're going to interview with before you come for the interview because you want to prepare yourself. If it's the person that's going to be your boss, you'll prepare yourself in that way. If it's an HR person that's going to screen you, then you'll be prepared for that and you'll know that you'll probably have another interview. Um, you wanna think about the questions and practice. We talked about that. Um, I think it's good to practice by yourself. I think it's good to have somebody else interview. So you can do either way you want to. You wanna dress appropriately for the interview. You wanna be clean, neat and professional. Now you don't have to go buy a bunch of business suits. It depends. Now if the job dictates that you wear a suit, you need to get a suit, um, but you don't have to spend a fortune. Um, you do need to look professional, clean and neat. It, appearance matters. And people want to have employees who will represent their company well. And you need to know because you don't know what the company dress code is when you're interviewing for a job. Now, you may find out later that the dress code for the company is a golf shirt and a pair of khakis. And that's fine. Then you can switch to that when you get the job. But for the purposes of an interview, you want to look a little better than that. You want to dress up a little more. You want to be on time. Nothing worse than being late for an interview. I suggest for an interview, you be early. I think you should be at least 10 minutes early because you don't know where you're gonna park, you need to make sure you get in on time, show up on time. You really need to look ahead of time where you're gonna go so that the morning or the day of an interview, you're not nervous. If you're on Zoom, you wanna sign in a few minutes before you're supposed to be there, make sure your technology works. Um, so that's important. And then you wanna disclose the parts of your background that you have to, but not more than you need to, but you have to be honest. And I put this in there because um, right before I left, I had someone who was applying for some credentials and an interview at the hospital, and they they needed to disclose that they'd ever been convicted of a felony, 
but they didn't mean to tell me they got arrested for a DUI 20 years ago. Now, that's fine if they want to put that because they feel guilty and they just want to tell everybody. But honestly, don't tell people things you don't have to tell them in a job interview, but tell them what you got to tell them so that you're honest. So you really want to think about what you have to tell people. If you got fired from a job, you don't necessarily have to tell people you got fired from a job. You can tell them that you left, that there was a mutual understanding. There's a lot of ways to say it besides that I got fired for poor attendance because it may cloud their perception of you as a potential employee in regard to your attendance. Okay, you want, uh, let me see. You want to be careful to answer questions about gaps in your resume or frequent job changes. You want to practice your response about why you want the job and what you can bring to the company. So think about it before. I'm telling you they're going to ask you, and if they don't, they're missing the boat on that one. You want to talk about what your future career goals are. Now, people want to hire people who have career aspirations, but they don't necessarily want to hire people who don't want to do the job they're hiring them for for a while. And so you want to be careful. It was funny. I had um, a new graduate nurse tell me about 10 years ago that their career aspiration was to have my job. Well, that's great, but I've been a nurse that at the time... 33 years and been in administration like 18 years or whatever. And this was a new graduate nurse with a bachelor's degree. It made me feel good that they admired what I did and had that goal, but they needed experience and they honestly needed to also go back to school and get a master's degree. And I told them, um, and we're friends since then, but I said, you know, I'm glad you want to do that. And I'm glad I've made it look like a good job, get some great experience, take advantage of opportunities and go back to school and get a master's degree. And one of these days you'll have it. Um, you want to be brief but honest. It is hard sometimes to know how to answer a question for a job interview. You don't want to have run-on conversations, but you, you don't want to do all yes or no's. So there's a happy medium there in answering a question to be pointed, but not just you can't shut up, you know, because then people are going to feel like you can't give them a straight answer. And you do need to have straight answers. Now, you do need to be thoughtful in your approach. I always tell people take a deep breath. If you're a fast talker like me, think about it. Think about what you're going to say before you answer the question so that you give it the most thoughtful answer that you can in the best way that you can. And use good grammar. You want to ask what you can, when you can expect to hear from the company. You should have some kind of a response back, yes or no. They owe you that. I think that's common courtesy. Um, it may be two weeks, maybe a month. They may have other candidates. You just need to know. And you might want to tell them the best way to contact you is either through your email or your cell phone, whichever you choose. You want to follow up the interview with the thank you note. I think this is a really nice thing. There are people now that send those thank you notes online through an email. I think that's fine. Handwritten notes are wonderful if you have good handwriting. Um, but I think either way, when you go for an interview, if you can get the business card of the person that you're interviewing with, I think that's a good social skill to do that to write somebody a thank you note for the interview and tell them you are very interested in the job. Don't ask about the salary unless they bring it up. It is wrong in an interview. It's the very first thing to bring up the salary. Now, I think they may ask you about a range that you're interested in. You may want to tell them what your previous salary was. You may have a realistic range. Don't go into a job thinking you're going to be a millionaire because it just doesn't work like that. But I think there is a place and time to negotiate salary, but it's not necessarily in the first interview. I think there are some salaries that are published. I know with, with public universities like UK, a lot of their salaries are posted online and ranges. If those are public universities and the salaries are posted, there's probably not a lot of room for negotiation, but you can see the range. I know sometimes in the uh, newspaper, I'll see jobs that are posted on weekends and for different public agencies, they'll say the salary. But in private agencies, they will often not. So I would not bring that up in the interview till you get offered the job. You want to understand the benefits, and this is a really big deal. Benefits are not to be taken for granted. As I told you, tuition reimbursement was huge for me, but other benefits are important. Things like, does the company contribute to a retirement plan for you? And how long before you can become vested where that retirement plan, plan is yours? Um, those things are important. Is child care subsidized? How much is the health care? They should be able to give you some sort of a piece of paper or send you something online with the benefits for the company that you should look at because the hourly salary is not always the most important thing. So be very careful to look at the whole package. You want to have a ballpark in mind if you do get asked of what you think is fair. Um, pay attention to non, and this should say um, non-cash, not non-case. I noticed this yesterday when I was prepping again. To non-cash benefits like health insurance and retirement. If you're not interested in the job, do not immediately react to a salary, or if you are interested, don't immediately react to a salary offer. Don't say, yes, I'll take it. 
it's really good to say, look, can I think about it for 24 hours and get back to you? And then really give it some thought. You don't have to always automatically respond, but you can't take too long in today's environment to make a decision. And you want to make sure that you understand the job expectations, the hours, weekend commitments, and holiday commitments. Sometimes those things aren't discussed, and those are important things and decisions when you're weighing your options. So what about advancing your career? So you've got a job and you want to advance your career. Well, first, what do you like to do? What are you good at? Where's your passion? Because you want to enjoy your role. I always tell people you need to be strategic about your careers. Good careers don't just happen. People decide what they, their goal is, and then they use their time wisely in their education, in their skills, in their networking, in their encounters to get there. Um, you want to do a SWOT for yourself, and I don't know if you've heard about SWOTs, but it's a diagram where you look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what are your strengths, and where are the things that you could do better? Where are the things where you're a little vulnerable? Maybe you're not flexible with your hours because you've got child care issues. That needs to be something taken into consideration when you look at your job. Maybe you can't have a job where you have to rotate shifts. Practice your communication skills, both written and verbal. If you need to practice verbal interviewing and communication skills, this is a great place to do that, either on Zoom or in person. They have the resources here to help you do that and are willing to help you practice interviewing if you're rusty at it, haven't done it for a while, or have not been successful. Be open to new opportunities and experiences. I think it's crazy. Sometimes uh, we've had people that have come in the hospital that have had other kinds of careers and had a family member who's been a patient, and they find that they have a real interest in healthcare. Because they were open to that opportunity, they really never got to see what people did until they had a family member that was a patient there. I love that because those people are there because they have calling. Um, work hard and be accountable. You know, sometimes it's not that you're always looking for that next step, but you always want to know, you know, will I be happy doing this job until I retire? Is this something that fulfills me? Is this something that I love, but I can't see myself doing it for 10 or 20 more years and I want to move on to do something else? Those questions are important to ask and manage up. Get to know your boss and work in your boss's style. It is very important to meet expectations. If you have a boss that uh, is somebody who likes to have an update frequently from you on progress, email them the update at the time that they want it, whether it's weekly or monthly. I had a boss that basically didn't want emails, they wanted to talk. So once every couple of weeks, I had a half an hour meeting with them to catch them up on what I was doing. Manage up. So after you get the job, what do you do? Well, one, you want to evaluate the culture of the company, and you want to look at the personality and options of the person you're reporting to. You want to learn more about your boss. Don't kiss up to the boss. You want to learn more about your boss. It's a professional relationship. You want to keep a positive attitude. Do not burn bridges. Um, if you really don't like what you're doing and you have some reason why, you want to objectively discuss that with the person you report to or with HR. Don't burn your bridges. If things don't work, Leave the role, you know, but don't trash the company in doing it. Build your presence and practice skills. You want to learn new things, how to present data, how to run reports, how to use computer systems, how to do presentations, how to work with teams. Those things are great skills. Take and accept responsibility. If you get asked to do something that's a new responsibility, say yes, because you can learn how to do it if you work hard enough, and people will teach you, and it's really important to take advantage of that so you can learn new things and share credit. One of the things that I appreciate the most is when things are successful, share the credit with the team. It's not just one person that did it. You want to be bold but not arrogant. You want to ask for opportunities, but you don't want to be impatient or arrogant. If you've been at the company for a year, you don't necessarily want to go in and ask to get promoted. You may want to look for promotion opportunities, but you want to make sure that you pick well. You want to network in the company as well. It's important to know other people. You want to explore where your skills and training would be good, maybe a different role in the company. You want to enhance your education because I think sometimes you don't know that you need an MBA or you need a bachelor's or an associate degree in something until you get in the company. You want to be a learner. Learners are people who are open to finding new things, new skills, and learning them. And you want to be a learner. You want to network with purpose. You want to meet maybe someone in a different department, um, someone in a role that might be able to open a door for you. You want to be picky with your discretionary time. And what I mean by that is be careful about time out of work with people that you work for. You want to be professional and you want to be careful about the presentation because that will cloud your uh, work reputation. 
You want to get involved with some aspect of your community. If you're not involved with something to give back, we all owe people to give back. I'm going to find mentors. I've always appreciated being able to be a mentor for others. People will do that. That doesn't mean they adopt you. There's usually a limited amount of time that they'll mentor you, but it's good to ask people for that career advice. You want to watch people. Some of the best people I've learned things from never know that I've observed them and have adopted some of their leadership skills. How to run a meeting, how to do a presentation, how to approach a tough subject. Those are really good things to watch people that do it well or people that don't do it well and don't do what they do. Um, you want to be open for opportunities and sacrifices, things that you need to do to move on. Pick your battles. No job is perfect. There is not a perfect job. Um, watch for trends and stay ahead of them. For example, we talked about maybe more processing jobs um, or right now something that's in demand. And you want to think, reflect, and get advice. If you need advice, this is the perfect place to do it. They'll do it remotely with you. They'll do it in person. You want to get advice and run through your strategies and plans. Talk about your goals. Talk about the steps that you need to do to prepare yourself and use resources like this to help you do that. So in conclusion, don't just switch a job lightly. It's a big deal. It reflects poorly on you if you're uh, jumping around from job to job. I used to call those job hoppers. You wanna prepare yourself ahead of time. You wanna think about the interview. You wanna go well prepared. You wanna dress appropriately. You wanna be on time. You wanna be sincere and you wanna know why you want the job. Be strategic. Don't think about a role as a job. It's a career step, and it will help you in other opportunities. You want to be the kind of employee that you would want working for you if you were the boss. You want to have initiative. You want to have some energy. You don't want to be somebody that people feel like they have to push. You want to be somebody that they feel like's always got some momentum. And you want to be friends with coworkers, but be mindful of boundaries. It's really important to be mindful of boundaries, and that goes even beyond into dating, and other kinds of relationships. Those are really touchy at work, and they can often negatively impact your career. And the last thing I wanted to say today was our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. And I've had an amazing career. Really, I've retired being able to do what I wanted to do and more in my career. But there were things that I applied for and things that I did not get, and there were good reasons why that happened. But in the end, that was a good thing for me, and it was just the right plan for me to not get something. But don't give up. You keep on trying, and you really want to be reflective of why did something not work out, what could you have done differently, and what next door is going to be there for you. I wish you good luck in your job search. Um, hopefully, 2022 will be a great year for you. I have hope for the health that we'll all have a great year. Um, and thank you for letting me come and speak to you today. Thank you, Karen, for our wonderful chat. That was so, so helpful. We really appreciate your content. All right, now we're ready to move on to the next stage of our program, who's hiring? So um, any employers with active job leads can make their way to the podium. I don't believe we have employer guests in person today, but in the chat box, please feel free to share uh, job leads and email them to ukalumnicareer at uky.edu, and we'll include them in the post job club newsletter that'll go out after lunch today. There are quite a few really good job leads that have come in in the last couple of days and employers continue to tell us that they have low candidate counts. It's a truly a candidate's market right now. Moving on, quick news from the Job Club Facilitators Group. Fitt County Cooperative Extension has great programming. Be sure to check those out online. We'll share those distribution links in the chat. Nicole with STEPS just shared a couple of great job leads from the STEPS group, this temporary employment with the University of Kentucky. Be sure to check those out. It's a great way to start your career at UK. And she sent quite a few really wonderful job leads for that newsletter. UK Alumni Career Services, Caroline and I are always here to support you and your career related needs. We serve life and active members of the UK Alumni Association. If you need more information on how to join, you can visit ukalumni.net forward slash career, and we're happy to support you. Oh, you have a question from the audience or from the? 
We have an employer in the chat box that is aware that the Salvation Army is hiring multiple roles and shifts and to check out the Salvation Army. Awesome. Awesome. Um, to that representative, be sure to email it to us and we'll make sure we get that into the job lead newsletter this afternoon too. Thank you for sharing that valuable lead. We always, always appreciate and welcome those, uh, that sharing in the group. All right. Next time at job club, December the 14th goal setting for career development uh, by a friend and colleague, Audrey Brockman, senior training specialist with UK HR training and development. She has presented to the Job Club community before, and she is fantastic. Please join. We'll share the registration link in the chat box. But you're always welcome to come in person at the Fayette County Cooperative Extension as well. On behalf of the UK Alumni Association, Fayette County Cooperative Extension, and UK HR Steps Temporary Employment, thank you for joining Job Club today. Bye-bye.